I would like to introduce Aidan Stephen, who is the 2019 winner of the David Mahe Travel Scholarship Award and the reason why this event is possible. On the death of our father, my sister Lindsay and I inaugurated the award in his name as a fitting remembrance both to him and our mother. They both had travelled widely and felt very strongly about the importance of difference. Colin Greensclade of the RSA was instrumental in setting this in place and RSA members review the applications from all four Scottish art colleges and select the recipient each year. Our father was a traveller. As a student, he spent his travelling scholarship over a harsh winter in Italy with John Houston, meeting up with other fellow artists. Extraordinarily, the ghastly living conditions didn't put him off. He so loved new, exhilarating experiences. He enjoyed difference, whether in people or surroundings. It didn't have to be dramatic. He took enormous pleasure and inspiration from very often simple differences of light, colour, textures, patterns and oddities that tickled him. He and our mother, who kept a huge number of detailed travel diaries, were both avid photographers and these images were to some extent a visual diary to augment the dozens of small sketchbooks that our father constantly worked in throughout his life. He drew in them, usually in black pen, adding verbal notes of colour, situation, etc. On one memorable trip to San Rafael, where he was born, while quietly propped against a wall in a small market drawing covertly, he began to be harangued by a cheesemonger. Fortunately, David's French language was up to it. He was being accused of being a health and safety inspector spy, note taking. All ended well when he showed and explained. He did buy an enormous hunk of cheese to further placate the gentleman, which we all enjoyed. Moments like this rather embarrassed him, but when over, he took great pleasure in the interaction and retelling of the story with a wry humour. Not dissimilar to his mother's story. On more than one occasion during the war, drawing in fields outside Hoyt, the local Bobby had to cycle out and reprimand her as she'd been spotted. Wearing a large hat and her tartan cape, she probably did appear to nosy neighbours as the archetypal spy image of the time. Our father set up student exchanges with Montpellier Art College. He reciprocated teaching time with Marco Krasvanovich, a printmaker from Belgrade who came to Edinburgh College of Art and dad learned more about printing processes over there. He was also a visiting teacher in Santa Barbara where Shell Kaganoff, a ceramicist taught. He too worked at Edinburgh College of Art for some time. This award is a fitting remembrance for students to embrace difference and to explore both themselves and their influences. I am delighted now to reintroduce Aidan who is a third generation Edinburgh College of Art graduate in his family, as I am, and the first Edinburgh College of Art recipient of this scholarship. He most certainly continues to explore and fulfil these criteria. There's a, there seems to be quite a difference between the degree show images and your printed images in the Latitudes exhibition. Would I be right in suggesting that the surface textures have changed? And was that a conscious decision? Soon. They seem to go on and on forever. I, I get absorbed in it. And also it's it's very much down, in, in my mind, it's very much down to 70 millimetre aspect ratio because mm -hmm. it, it was a type of film that um, was always known as twice as big, twice as colourful, twice as much sound. And when people went to the cinema, they, they got twice the screen. Yes. Uh, and much wider. And... I mean, I've seen other artists use it, even um, Rembrandt's used it before. Uh, other artists who've, who've gone for that sort of aspect ratio. And it was only the other day I was, I was sitting thinking, I wonder why I've always been so focused on what I call a sort of letterbox ratio. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, I did send, spend a lot of time sitting looking out of a tank and all you have there is, <laughs> is a letterbox. And so we'd be driving across the Canadian prairie um, 
across this vast empty nothingness um, with rolling sort of hills and dips and everything else but all I could see was this letterbox and, and so perhaps there's a there's an element of that in it uh, and has I've that always come to you more recently thinking that that may have been what started it these ideas always crop into your head when you're least expecting them you suddenly go oh you know brainwave suddenly I, I maybe that's what it is or are you catching um, at straws trying to find a rationale for it? <laughs> always trying to work out what's going on in my mind, but uh, it's, that's more complicated. But yeah, and uh, film definitely has a massive influence on that. Uh, mm. And, you know, I, I do watch an awful lot of movies and I'm very interested in cinematography. And I think when, when 70 millimeters started to sort of die out in, in the late, well, late 60s, early 70s, and which was before my time, but you look back at these massive films like Lawrence of Arabia and mm -hmm. even My Fair Lady was shot in 70 millimeter. Um, but you, you sort of go, well, that's, that's gone. It's, it's past, it's, it's no longer. And then there are only two directors, Quentin Tarantino and Christopher Nolan, who still shoot in 70 millimeter. Mm -hmm. And the difference when you go to the cinema and see Dunkirk, for example, in yeah. 70 mil is phenomenal. But you know, it, there was a little bit of an element to me about things that have gone and that things that we've lost that we possibly won't appreciate again. Um, because there is a, an immense stillness and calmness about what you portrayed in these ones particularly early on. And it's partly to do with the colour, I think, also. They're much paler. A lot of the Crinan ones are really quite dark and very... Uh, not that these ones aren't atmospheric, but it's a very different kind of atmosphere that you've created with all the water. And they're quite, quite, quite dark. And yet I think of being over there and you outside there working, you know, was there not a lovely bright summer's day at some point? Yes, it's, it, it was an interesting, that, that's a good question because I made a conscious decision was a couple of conscious decisions. One, one was very much about colour, mm -hmm. uh, which was, even before I started college, I, I put it in my mind that I was going to use a lot of colour. And I sort of had a suspicion that when people learnt my background, they might be asking or thinking that I was going to be producing these rather dark, gloomy, um, sort of, I don't know, evocative, but well, melancholic not... painting. Yeah. They're not gloomy, though. I mean, the colour is so rich in them that they're definitely not gloomy. And that's that's why I decided that, that you know, I really got to get some colour in. Um, and oh. I was occasionally harassed, uh, you know, what about trying something in a monotone or, you know, <laughs> just, and I just persisted. But when, we, when, we, when I got to Crinan, uh, I don't know what it was. I, I spent all day looking at these wonderful sunny views mm. but it wasn't till the sun was setting that I suddenly got wow you know this is you know that's inspiring um, mm. and the number of colors that would appear mm. and, and, and that that sort of variation and you do get a lot of that on the west coast of Scotland yes uh, and I just thought this is fantastic and I mean even in Bosnia I tried to find a sunset or you know a, a sunrise that had those sort of colors and there was nothing it, it it didn't happen. Can I just come in and say that we've had um, uh, a question on the uh, on the Q and A facility, um, asking if we could maybe see some of the work, and and perhaps a bit of background about your um, your travel to just to put the the conversation in context. Yeah. Maybe we could do that now. I can do that now. And can I just say to everybody, I forgot to say at the beginning, but I'm sure everybody knows that if you have any questions, do just um, type them into the Q&A facility and we will either answer them throughout the talk or, or answer them at the end. So this is just one example of the 70 millimetre panels. Uh, I did actually make 256 for my degree show, so... Uh, don't, don't blame me for the choice. This is one of a number. And was this one based in reality? I mean, you seem to sort of grab things from various situations and then put them together. There was a little, so during this period, I was uh, 
watching a lot of westerns you're quite correct mm -hmm. <laughs> uh my father used to watch a western every sunday morning every sunday. It, well it was yeah. sunday afternoon in our house <laughs> or sunday afternoon i should say yeah and uh and it stuck in my mind from childhood so wow. anyway i watched a lot of westerns and one of the things about westerns is they're slightly cheaper to make as films because all you need is a landscape and a couple of horses and essentially you've got your um <laughs> you've got your backdrop but that's a, that's a task for the cinematographer so he he then has to go out and find these wonderful sort of vistas and and you know high plains drifter whatever uh, and this is actually an opening scene from uh, No Country for Old Men, which was uh, one of the Coen brothers' films. Mm -hmm. And the way I worked at this point was I would take a, a screen grab uh, on my phone of whatever film I was watching and then print it out very small and then work from that as a, as a you know, a sort of a, an impetus would just be this tiny little, I've, I've got some of them actually behind me here. Um, little sort of screen screen printouts oh. um, and so most well not all of them but at least half of, of these images came from westerns um, and landscapes that I liked but obviously the cinematographer had liked as well so there was a uh, yeah it was fun going and watching all these films and just going I like this landscape <laughs> wishing you'd taken the photograph but you are an award-winning photographer and you have published you know photographic work so one can see the kind of the joining up of the forces there so I'll forgive you taking screenshots from the telly but, <laughs> because you could have done it yourself I'm sure but it's um do you use your own photographs often to work from yeah uh, quite often and mm -hmm. not I mean not my past photographs but certainly now so now it's a lot of you know if I, uh, I, I don't know how your father um, I mean, you said he used a marker pen and he'd, he'd write notes about colour and yes. things. I mean, I, I very much, when I'm taking the photograph, I've, I'm already thinking about the painting as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds slightly strange, but I, when I'm taking the photograph, because I'm thinking about the painting, in the back of my head, I, I already know what I want to try and achieve. It's never going to turn out the way I'd like it to, but it's, it's in there. It's, it's sort of... So when I see the photograph again, I sort of get right. I know what I wanted here. But for um, all the photographs that our father took, very rarely, if ever, did I see them in his studio when he was working. So I don't know if he ever went back to them or they were just a, a kind of almost like a sort of crutch memory that he knew they were there, but he didn't use them as reference points. But they took thousands and thousands of photographs. But so whether he could remember what he'd taken, maybe you do this as well, and something of them stays with you while you're trying to transform them into a painted visual. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I was painting um, Australian landscapes uh, just, well, from memory, but very much from, it's, it's, it's confusing at times because I think, uh, memory is 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 such a well it's a bit of a minefield because you think you remember something and actually what you're remembering is a photograph that you saw in a <laughs> photo album <laughs> or all the other way around you know you you see a photograph and you go oh yeah I definitely remember that you have absolutely no idea um but it's certainly with Australia it was memories, yeah with, with Australia it was very much the the place and time there was one particular in, in fact i think it's it's probably one of those moments in my life when i just went this is why i enjoy these big wide open landscapes was being in the outback and at night and it was as if somebody just put a blue filter across the sun it was daylight but it was just blue and you could see everything with the you know crystal the same as you would during the day it's just somebody stuck a filter over it and this big red kangaroo was leaning over a fence at the homestead to eat the grass that had obviously been, was the only grass for, for miles because it was watered. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd been out to feed the dogs and I came back and there was this kangaroo standing there looking at me. And I'd never seen a big red before. And I thought, I do not want to get close to this thing. <laughs> but it just bounced off. But I saw it go for about 800 meters, just watched it 
bouncing off into the dark. Quite so how, how much time did you spend in Australia? In total, about three years, because I lived there with my father and my mother when we were when I was younger. Ah. Oh. Um, um, between the ages of about ten and twelve, and then I went back and worked out there uh, when I was seventeen, eighteen. Um, and 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 that was a was a big influence in sort of all sorts of things in later life, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you have another image to yeah. entertain us with? Um, so I mentioned I, I painted quite a few of these. Uh, <laughs> these are two exhibitions I had at, while I was at ECA. One is uh, on the left is uh, 222. So that's 222 of those panels um, laid out on the sculpture court floor. And, and on the right is the 39 steps. Um, so there are 39 panels going up. Essentially, what are 39 steps at ECA? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, can I just say we've had another couple of questions then. Um, so people keen to hear about what you did with your travel award and where you traveled to and to maybe see some of the images of Bosnia. Yep. We will get there. I think we're coming mm -hmm. up to that. Um, we've got a couple more of those uh, panels, which I'll just show you briefly. There's one without the film holes on the sides, but it's still that's about the size of a uh, eight and a half shoe sole, if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to say why you went back to Bosnia, Aidan? Yeah, do, Alison, please. Okay. Well, Aidan was in the army for a good number of years, about 22, or yeah? Uh, 17, yeah. 17. And in 1995, you were in the Armed Forces Humanitarian Coordination Officer, working in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in an area that was rural and isolated, Danji Boraci. And you had a really hard job there and you were awarded a commendation for exceptional services and you were granted freedom of two municipalities, a huge honour. And in spite of all the traumatic times going on then, this is where you chose to return to. Did that not fill you with, was that one of the main places apart from California that you wanted to go back to? Yes, I, I, I mean, the proposal was, was very much driven by something I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't been traveling for a number, well, a long time actually, before I put in that proposal. And for some reason, I thought that the first place I would go back to would be, be Bosnia. And um, yeah, I think, well, I can't remember exactly what the next slide is though. Sorry, that, that's my degree show. But here we are. So um, Barachi, yeah, it was the center of a place called the Anvil in Bosnia. And it's the area that we were responsible for was about um, 240 square kilometers, something like that. And there were about 90 of us in this uh, a metal box factory. Um, most of the time we were there, it snowed rather more than it's snowing here today. <laughs> and it was a lot colder. Um, and and on the on the right, that's me. In it's actually 1996 here, um, standing outside an artist's studio um, up in the mountains. And one of the reasons I wanted to go back, and, it, and probably actually what drove me back more than anything else, was it's the last place that I really remember having a profound purpose. Um, because my job was to, I was solely responsible for rebuilding the local communities over that large area. And I had over, during that time, I had about 250 uh, sort of requests for monetary funding and, and building works, whether that be schools or hospitals or bakeries or you know, anything that was essential to rebuilding the communities. And so that six months was incredibly busy. Um, and, and in many ways, incredibly rewarding, but it was also the first time I'd really witnessed 
the proper effect of war and 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 what it could do to civilians um let alone what it could do to soldiers but what it could do to civilians and when i left uh, bosnia i i was uh, I, d I was quite angry actually because i got back and the first thing i did was went to go and buy an iron in john lewis and there were all these people walking around with big carrier bags full of shopping and you know brand labels and and this and that and i walked in and i thought god you've got no idea this is you know only 1500 miles away from us there's there's just people living on a bread line um in the snow with with nothing anyway i mean that was a primary reason i there's something cathartic about returning places as well and um for me this was a a, a big ask especially as an artist, I didn't know how my response would be compared to had I continued in the army, et cetera. So. Was the artist that you'd met first time round there, was he still there? Did you manage to re-meet with him? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, he was called Borrow and he, he, as I said, he lived in the mountains in this, this little hut. Um, and he'd managed to survive the war by <laughs> essentially by being an artist. Everyone thought he was crazy or a monk or you know they they left him alone and he painted away and was very happy uh when i booked accommodation in barachi i didn't realize that i booked it on borrows what he'd been doing for the last 23 years is building um huts up next to his own uh, original hut uh, so, so the, where we ended up staying was on borrows new little um B and B essentially, <laughs> uh, but also this man who Ranko, who um, I'm, I'm a great believer in serendipity, and one of the one of the people I worked with a lot in Bosnia was Ranko. He he essentially gave me all of these contracts to look at. Uh, so he would go around the villages saying, "This village really needs this, or this village needs food. It's locked out, locked out in the in the snow. Can we get somebody up there to deliver it? Whatever." And so I worked with him pretty much day in, day out. And I thought before we went, before we left for Bosnia, I thought, wouldn't it be great to see Ranko again? And so I tried to contact him and there was, there was no response. The only thing I could find out was that he'd left uh, about 10 years before and gone to Slovenia um, where he was living with his wife and no one had a contact detail for him. But the day we arrived in Barachi, uh, as soon as we arrived here with Boro, there he was, Ranko. And he was there for 24 hours. He'd come down to look at some of the huts and help fix them. And so all of those years apart, and we managed to coincide at exactly the same time. That, uh, that's extraordinary. So that's the two of us sat there, pretty much in shock, actually. We sat for about 40 minutes, just um, unable to speak to each other, not just because of the language barriers, but <laughs> because we just couldn't believe it. So. Um, when we did eventually get somebody to come and help uh, work it all out, we had a we had a long chat, sort of uh, for a couple of hours. And yeah, it was that was extraordinary, but uh, and very rewarding. Do you, is your sniper's image to hand? There we are. So this is very much in the early stages of working on it, but it gives you some sense of the scale. And was that from that area, Aidan? Uh, it was from right above um, Borrow's camp, uh, right. and w which I had visited during, um, you know, when I was there in '96. I'd been up there, and it was it was all covered in snow then. So to me, this view was completely new. Um, it's very. It's almost illustrative. This one, rather than. Like your degree show paintings, is a uh, it looks more constructed. Is that, is that yes, a uh, yes. Comment? I got quite absorbed by this painting. I spent a long time over it, which I don't uh, normally. I, I paint quite quickly, uh, and um, for, for numerous reasons, I, I I really sort of I wanted to try and capture it. I was actually working from video which was quite fun because uh, I'd panned a video across the landscape when I was there. And so, so I've also done that. Version, then? 
This is a slightly stretched out version of what slightly was that? stretched out version, yeah. Oh. Um, and that little that little panel I showed you earlier, that was um, that was my prelim sketch, which I actually did from the top here. Um, so um, yeah, it, it's you're right. It's there was uh, there was something quite symbolic about being back there and being up there, and actually, I, I, I've also got vertigo. So I was standing on the <laughs> the edge of this. Um, what well, you do help yourself, do you? <laughs> thinking, oh dear, this is quite fun, isn't it? But I had I had uh, yeah a good few hours up there and just taking video and. Um, sketching and uh those you know the panels uh and when i got back this this big canvas just said hi could you put some paint on me please so i did you um, were implying there that you really like to work quite quickly on things but you paint using oil paint do you predominantly have you um, ever I... sorry, sorry Anson, yeah. i was just going to say have you ever worked with acrylics because it's much much quicker to get a new thing if you like to work quickly i'm always uh, intrigued that people who like to work quickly use oil paint because it seemed you seem to have to wait forever for think layers to dry and move and i sort of it's it's funny i i suppose because and i'm, I'm probably going to put my foot in it here because i'm going to say something a little bit controversial but go on <laughs> <laughs> At art college, you're not taught how to paint. No. Um, you, you have to learn. And, and, you know, unless you actually ask the question of somebody, you know, how do I do this? What, you know, what is layering? What is glazing? What is, uh, no one's going to teach you. You don't have lessons on how to do various things. So I very much uh, found my own way and, mm -hmm. and, and then asked questions when I needed, when I got lost. Uh, but I, I predominantly work wet on wet. With oil, I find that really exciting mm -hmm. um, because it, it it means there's a there's an element of risk <laughs> at all times, um, and then there's also that element of well, it, I don't like it, so I'm just going to wipe it off, and it's it, because it's oil, it, it comes off nice and easy. Whereas acrylic, if you leave it more than a couple of minutes, you you've got a problem. <laughs> 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 um, but I, th there's many different ways of skinning a cat, but that's. Certainly, I, I mean, working wet on wet, that's why I work quite quickly. Um, and there are times when I have to let something dry in order to, but if I'm working on three or four things at the same time, which I try to do, yes. then that's okay. I can leave that behind and yes. come back to it. Yeah. That's interesting. Excellent. And ha have you got your challenger? Am I right? Is this? Yes, this is challenger. Um, this, when I saw it, was such a quantum leap. I thought he's put in something by somebody else here. Where did that on earth come from? Um, <laughs> from my mind, no. It's, it. I was. I was uh, obviously a mature student when I went to art college. I didn't go there at eighteen and take thirty years to get my degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it felt like it, but there we are. Um, and I was really challenged. I, I, I didn't know what was expected of us as students. I, I was expecting to do a life drawing or, you know, um, portraiture or something. Um, I was quite naive in that sense. And w when I got there, there were all these young, wonderfully enthusiastic kids running around doing all these amazing things. And I thought, I, I know, I, I have to be abstract. I've just got to do something abstract. So um, I... I ended up doing this, and it's uh, actually the interior of a tank, um, but as a cutaway. Taken away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm really pleased because the RSA decided to hang it uh, in portrait rather than in landscape, which it's supposed to be in. Oh. So, and I did, and I didn't correct them because I actually much prefer it in portrait. <laughs> and I'd never seen that while it, you know, while it was hanging up before. So. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's uh, very different from my other work, but you and never have, know. Have you done others abstractions? I have. I've done yeah. many, uh -huh. um, none of which I'd like to show anyone at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll no, I've, we'll come back to them one day. 
and go, wow, actually, maybe that was all right. But uh, yeah. Maybe we should all turn our paintings sideways from time to time. It'd be quite a nice thing to do. And your wonderful luminous Paint Me Yellow. Oh, there. Yeah, Paint Me Yellow, that was uh, actually last year. Um, when was it last February? It's much thinner use of paint on this one, is there? As I say, it's really hard to tell when you're not up against. Yeah, it's, it's one that I'd really love for people to be able to see in person. Mm. Uh, it, it's actually, it comes okay. It comes across okay here, but it's uh, another thing that I'm, I'm not, I don't use very often. I'm, I'm normally quite um, not against, but I, I don't use an awful lot of um, turpentine. No. Um, um, in fact, none really. <laughs> I, I use the odd medium to, to mix my oils, but I don't use a lot of turpentine. And it's not because I'm, I'm sort of um, conscious of, of the environment, although that's a really good bonus. Uh, but it's, it's more because I, I, I don't like the smell. <laughs> and this painting, I used a lot of turps, uh, which is why it's so thin. Yeah, I, and that's why I wondered. No, I use acrylics for the same reason because turpentine goes for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a wonderful, wonderful tutor who said, um, "Oh, I do like a bit of Naples yellow in a painting." <laughs> bit of that. So I thought, what if the whole painting was pretty much Naples yellow? <laughs> and then I had this idea for a desert-esque landscape. Um, so paint me yellow was was what the canvas said to me when I walked into the room, it just said paint me yellow, so I did. And it, then the it of this reminds me of when you dye eggs and onion skins with bits of plant form underneath them. And it gives that kind of lovely luminosity of the, the plant forms coming through it. It's a very satisfying piece of work. Um, and what, well, thank you. What you can't see in detail here is, is um, there's actually a, a rider on a horse. Um, if you really? look, if you look left, there's a, a sort of slightly ochre ridge coming down. Yeah. Oh, I see him now. And there's a little rider on a horse, and so he's looking out across this, um, well, these series of valleys and dips and levees and and. I, you, yeah. Because at this distance, obviously, looking on the small screen as everybody is this evening and yeah. it's, you know, it's a shame because that to me just looked you know part of that little rocky rocky line there uh yeah so that that's it's interesting well I, I don't know how people interpret that i mean obviously i've got my own ideas about what i was thinking but um can i ask about the way you presented the crinon do you have the crinon yeah i do the block oh. Well, that so that's uh, just an intro into Crinan, um, and there's one of my little panels, but a, a little plein air painting of the harbour during the daytime, mm. um, and then, so in some form, these twelve paintings. Uh, I was hoping if they'd been hung in the RSA, those those twelve would have been. I, I believe there's over. 4,760 variations possible with 12 paintings. So the way I could have hung it. Uh, so don't think that this is my final decision, but that is actually essentially what I did um, as a mock-up uh, of to, to show the RSA, you know, if they were gonna hang it, I wanted them quite close mm. together rather than, and, and that's not because we were confined to space. It was, it was more because, uh, well, actually, I, Alison, you know about this, don't you? You know about my your particular drive thing. jumping around your EMDR yeah. response to things. Because originally, when I first looked at this as a grouping, I didn't know. And you were saying it's a sort of movable feast, but I wondered how long it took to calculate because it's such a mixture of very cold colours and then combinations of warm and cold and then very warm ones that come over completely warm despite having cold in them. And I wondered how calculated you'd been about the way you'd arrange these. I thought about it for weeks and months and um, every day for hours and hours. I would love to say that to you, 
but when, when you arrange things in, in this kind of shape close together like this and you're looking at one, it's actually lovely to have this total immersion round about you. You're, you're not necessarily wanting to move away from the one you're looking at, but you do want to have little sneaky peeks of the atmosphere round about because it creates a sort of total, a total pulling in of the person. And unlike being in a normal gallery where you're jumping from one very often completely disconnected image by one artist to another one. And really sometimes when you've gone round a gallery or an exhibition, you actually can't remember very much of what you've seen a lot of the time or been specific because we tend not to spend long enough looking at a given painting and we should all take notes as we go but these pull you in various directions and you have a theory about this rapid eye movement but I don't think it has to be a rapid thing it's like having a the sort of pinprick eye test at the at spec savers when it's a little like that yeah peripheral, it's, it's peripheral vision stuff yeah, it's a technique used by therapists to help people with trauma. And uh, I won't go into all the specifics of it, but essentially it's asking your, you to concentrate on one particular thing, but your eye is then subconsciously or not drawn to other things. And the movement in itself sort of um, helps you deconstruct the initial image. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I did my degree show, I had rather more than this up on one wall and, and people came in. And some people came in and just walked straight out because it was too much for them. <laughs> but other people came in and stood there for quite a long time looking at either an individual image or, or, or a number of them together. Uh, and just looking at that screen now, my eyes jumping around like crazy. Um, it's one of the reasons why I watch a lot of movies, actually, because I like my eye having to constantly be asked to look in different directions so um, although it's a rapid it's supposed to be a rapid eye movement thing looking at these you actually don't want to move quickly from one to the other you're aware of them on the edge but it's quite nice because of the subject matter and everything's very calm and inviting in whether it's both visually going somewhere centrally in the image or a color in the distance you're, you're pulled into each one quite individually, even if they're on the sidelines. I don't think you feel you need to leap from one to the other. You're sort of, you know, sucked, sucked into it slightly. Yes. Um, thank you for saying that. So, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm sucked into all of them because when I'm painting them, I'm, that's where I am. I'm in the painting. Uh, and I, I think, uh, you mentioned this one. The more observant may notice there's a hair on it, but I've removed that. It's no longer there. <laughs> this was one, I think, that, if you like, bothered me more than any of the others, which is, you know, it's not a disparaging thing that I'm seeing the slightest, Aidan. And I think because all the others have a finite central viewpoint, which takes you there, but where this one's going, you've got this sort of chop, choppy paint. Yeah. It's, where you uh, it's, want it to be, you know, an end in sight, as it were. It's quite an aggressive um, middle section. Yes. And, and um, I, I remember this moment very well. It was, uh, you know, that when the sun is almost at its strongest, mm -hmm. it's just about to sink below the horizon, and you can't look at it because it's so bright. Um, and you know, if you take a photograph of it, you get all those lines coming zooming yeah. out because it just won't, the camera won't cope with it. Your eye can't cope with it. And I've been looking at um, some of Taggart paintings actually, and noticed how impasto and, you know, the, and quick his work was. And I wasn't trying to replicate that in any sense, but I think that probably had some impression on me. And it was an attempt to try and capture that. I can't look at the sunset, <laughs> but it is actually one of those powerful moments. But just before it drops, you know that um, that's that's the moment I always enjoy about sunsets. Is a lot of yeah. And and the the, the scratchiness at the front. Um, I was using a a wood graining tool, 
over the top of the oil paint to sort of just move it around. Um, yeah, it's it's a challenging painting for me as well, but actually, and, and I don't think these colors are particularly re representative of how it is in reality. Uh, although <laughs> I hope that it's one of those paintings I'll come back to in, in a couple of years and go, well, what was wrong with it? And, and, and actually what could, what could I use from it? And uh, what works and what doesn't? And be all right to put it up because actually for me, it's, uh, I, I had it out all day today. I'm um, just sat there so I could look at it. And the more I looked at it, the more I liked it. Uh, but it, it was a very different sort of uh, question of, of why. So I, yeah. Yes. Perhaps when people see it for real, that, that it's a, a different, doesn't photograph well. It's a good painting for radio. <laughs> I think that applies to all of us. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> Sheena, do you have any more questions? Oh, I love this one. This is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Yes, we have a couple of questions in. Um, so one of our attendees is asking, are aspects of the photographs altered for your artistic vision or are they true to life? That are rarely traces of humanity in your work. Is this on purpose? Right, yes, it's a good question. I deliberately leave out most traces of humanity if I can. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that Ansel Adams was very uh, good about this. He, somebody asked him why there were no people in his photographs. And he said, well, there's, there's always two people. There's, there's the viewer and the photographer. <laughs> and there's a little bit of that with me. It's, it's there is always somebody in the, in the painting. It's the artist and, and the person looking at it. And what I love about landscapes is, is their permanence. And I see us and our, our impermanence, as it were, that you, know, you put boats and buildings and flagpoles and telegraph poles into your paintings. They're not gonna be there forever. Uh, I like to think of the landscape as, as it has been for thousands of years. And so sort of hooking into that longevity of the landscape and not, not the, um, not the replication of, of what I actually see. So yes, I do alter those paintings. I hope that answers the question. It's having um, somebody well. else has a, a question. Leo's asking, were you aware of the official war artists in Bosnia at the time, such as Peter Harrison and Hugo Grenville? Peter Harrison, yes, definitely. I, and who wouldn't have been at the time? And 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 for well, I mean, I've read about that. Uh, and I've seen some of his paintings. In fact, there's one that hangs in combat stress over in Ayrshire. Uh, I think it still hangs there. I think it might have been put up for auction, but a harrowing, absolutely harrowing. And uh, yeah, he, yes, I wasn't aware of, of the others, but Peter House, definitely. And um, so anybody else got any questions? We've got a few minutes left. If anybody else wants to type in any questions. You talked a bit, um, Aidan, about you know the changes in Bosnia itself but also the the changes in yourself I don't know if you want to talk a bit, bit more about that uh, well actually can I just briefly talk about this photograph no of course <laughs> um something you might have noticed in the in the the IBID series in the same place um IBID means I be them which is in the same place and um we were in Crinan and I all of those images come from exactly the same spot and this is actually my wife, her brother and her sister in a boat that is tied by her father to this rock. <laughs> and, and so the rock suddenly became this part of all of those IBID images. I, mean, I think six out of the 12 have the rocks in them. Um, talking about that permanence again. And I know certainly my sister-in-law, she, uh, whenever she goes back to Crinan, she always finds that rock and goes, you know, nothing's changed, there's, there's, there is a permanence here. The rock is still there. So I hope that gives some sort of idea about why the rocks are so prominent. But uh, anyway, moving on. There's a great sense of sort of, you were saying that all these places physically are going to stay like that for a lot longer than we are. But in all these 
pictures that you're creating, there's a, a sense of kind of aloneness within that landscape. But, but it's not a frightening aloneness. You know that something about it is impermanent, but that's the person that's there. It's not the stuff that's around you. And I find yeah. that quite moving about them because you put yourself in that situation, but then you take yourself away from it. And it's... Um, it's... I spent a, a, a number of years in the desert on and off in different sort of places and, and there's nothing to make you feel more insignificant than mm. being out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I think that feeling quite often comes to me when I'm looking at something beautiful as well, any landscape. And, and now perhaps that, you know, that focus from deserts and flat horizons and nothingness is, is certainly for me is moving into more you know, Scotland and mountains and the sea and being home again and, and sort of actually yeah, yeah. sort of settling with myself that I don't need to revisit these places. I can, I can be here back mm. in Scotland. Um, and Bosnia certainly showed me that because I, I went back there and it was, it was an amazing trip. I, I would give anything to do it again, but, and I probably will actually. Really? Go back. Yeah. Well, somebody else has asked, is there somewhere else you'd like to revisit after having returned to Bosnia? Uh, probably Australia, because it's really safe at the moment. <laughs> they wouldn't <laughs> let you in, Aidan. <laughs> uh, no, I did, I did think about, uh, about well, what was it now, six, seven, no, eight years ago, I thought about going back to Iraq uh, as another, and I didn't. Um, uh, I decided to go to Yemen instead. So I, I went there for three weeks and uh, that was beautiful, beautiful. I would love to go back to Yemen. Obviously now it's not the same as it was when I was there. But that was one of the most beautiful places I've been to on earth. It was quite stunning. So perhaps Yemen, yeah. Mm. If it ever goes back to normal. Mm. Well, I think we've come to the end of our questions. Um... So thank you very much indeed, Aidan, for coming thank and talking to us. And yeah, thank yeah. you, Alison, for um, hosting the, the uh, talk tonight. Pleasure. He is such a worthy recipient. The uh, uh, exhibition is still available to view online. So if you've not seen the work, please do go and visit that. And um, do look out for our next event, which is on the 23rd of February at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is a new time for us, but um, we'll see how that goes. So can I just say thanks again to everybody for coming and thanks to Alison and Eden again. Well, thank you, Sheena, for knocking us into shape, getting this sorted. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Sheena. And Alison, I can't thank you and your family enough. It was a fantastic award. and. Um, you know, as I said before, many, many years I hope to come of, of artists benefiting from it. Well.